know it's 6 30 and then it's just shut up and sit down. It's probably the best thing. Send me her phone number. I mean, her call oh, number. Right. Her address. I'd like to do that. Okay, there we are. How y'all doing tonight? Great. Okay. Doing okay. All right, good. Well, I want to welcome you here to Wednesday Night Live. If you're here, uh, just said hi to you. If you're watching, I'll say hi to you as well. And I'm uh, glad that y'all could join us. Feel free to comment. And uh, maybe if you can do it, sometimes you can. Uh, some of y'all don't want to arrange all that while we're in the view and then start echoing me. But if you want to comment on the phone or your iPad that way, or you know, if you're watching online, you want to comment. Uh, that would be great. We want to start a watch party. That would be fine as well. So we're here on Wednesday Night Live, and uh, I want to tell you, I don't feel any shame. Maybe I should feel some shame in saying this, uh, but the best part of any wedding that I've ever been a part of, I've done quite a few weddings as a, as a minister, and the best part is always the reception. Can I get an amen? Amen. The reception is the best part. Well, today we're going to talk about the kingdom and the wedding feast. And a wedding feast in Matthew chapter 22. You may go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 22. And, uh, you know, it's good when you go to a wedding and the food is free. Uh, it's better when the food is free and it's really good. And so uh, I enjoy that. I'm not even really a big fan of wedding cake. Anybody ever a big fan of wedding cake? Y'all like the wedding cake? You know what I like for me? It's about bread and pasta. Uh, there's usually some sort of muscatoli kind of thing, mastacholi. I don't know how to say that. Um, you know, it's bad enough when you have to squeeze into your soup when you're doing a wedding, but, but it's even worse when you got two servings of mascarpone in you, and uh, then you're really hurting, right? But it's worth it because it's free and it's fun, right? Now I've been tempted sometimes. I shouldn't say this. Tempted sometimes to skip the wedding just to go to the reception. That's horrible to say, but but that's part of it. So we've been looking at the kingdom gospel, particularly where. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like such and such. And today he, he talks about a wedding feast. He describes the kingdom like this party that everybody should want to go to, right? But very few actually go to. And so if you have your copy of God's Word, if you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 22. I want us to look there together and maybe dialogue a little bit about this parable, this interesting parable. A lot of the characters, like we said last week, a lot of the characters now at this point, if you've been with us the last 14 weeks, are pretty familiar to you. He says, he says, and again, Jesus spoke to them in parables. He said, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who usually is the king. And God's usually the king, right? It makes sense. Who gave a wedding feast for his son. Now, don't look into son too much, maybe. Um, but let's take a look at the broad thing. So the king was having a wedding. For a king to have a wedding in ancient days was a countrywide celebration that would go on for days and days and days. It was a party. And that feast really represents the fellowship that we have with God when we enter into that kingdom. The king is inviting people into fellowship with himself. I want you to see that picture. That he's saying, I have something worth celebrating. I have good news that my servants are bringing to you. I want you to come and enjoy this covenant experience. I want you to be a part of this party. And so that feast, in a sense, represents being saved and knowing what it's like to enter into that kingdom. But there's also kind of a final, a finality to this kingdom picture as well. Look at verse 3 through 7. The calling of the invited. It says, And he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. They just refused to come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered. That's what I say when I'm walking up a hill. My fat calves have been slaughtered. Just, it's okay to laugh. Just do it for me, all right? And everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention, and they went off. One to his farm, another to his business. Uh, while the rest actually seized the servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. So the king was angry, and he sent his troops, and he destroyed those murderers, and he burned their city. Pretty extreme picture. 
that we're seeing, right? So these guys were close at hand to the king. They were in close proximity to the king. They knew who the king was, and that's why they were invited first. But they refused to come to the party. That would have been, in the ancient world, an incredible insult to the king, and actually an affront upon his authority. Uh, man, when the king says, come, you come. You know, it's kind of different because we uh, elect a president every four or eight years, and uh, half the country don't like the guy, and then we elect somebody else. Half, the other half of the country don't like him, right? Uh, this is different. This is a king, right? In America, we go, I'm going to vote, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to put the political sign. Uh, you didn't do that <laughs> in the ancient world, right? You didn't put the king's enemy uh, sign on your on your lawn, or else your house would get burned out, right? You, it just it wasn't that way. And so this was a serious deal. And so clearly, as you've seen the last couple of weeks, Jesus is really attacking um, and rightfully so, Israel's faith leaders, their religious leaders, the ones that were invited in the world's eyes, the ones that would see themselves as invited, the ones that were in close proximity with the God of Israel and with the Old Testament, uh, they were the main players. And yet when God speaks through the prophets that God sent time and time again to get them to understand who God is, they simply just spit in God's face. Uh, Jesus was right when he said of them, and when Isaiah prophesied of them, that outwardly they have the appearance of godliness, but inside their hearts are far from God. And so the original heirs of the kingdom have rejected it. And so the king, in the, in the parable, <coughs> burns the city, and that's an extreme punishment. And you say, that sounds extreme. That's because it is. Uh, but it was for an extreme punishment to a serious crime, treason. And many take that as an allusion to the destruction of of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD, and that's probably the case, that, that these faith leaders had rejected the Messiah that was prophesied by that people. And, 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 and hear me, Jesus himself being Jewish. And so this is not a racial issue that's going on here. And most of the writers of our Bible, most of the writers in the New Testament are Jewish people. And so this is not a, when well, the Gentiles had it right, the Jewish people. Man, apart from God's grace, we all have it. And, and yet these faith leaders had so turned this country uh, and, and that nation away from God that God then, a few decades later, allows Roman troops to march into Jerusalem and to take out the biggest, most extreme, most beautiful, most breathtaking uh, instrument, symbol of their faith. He said, no, you guys don't get to have this anymore. And he takes their toys away like I had to take the toys away from my kids, but in more dramatic fashion. So this is another parable criticizing the establishment. And, and it's easy for us to read that and go, yeah, they did have it wrong. But be careful that in 2020, that we aren't the establishment. That we aren't the religious folks, kind of sitting in our organized religion um, and, and just kind of turning our nose up at people and just believing that we got it figured out, that we're so holy and righteous. Uh, that we have the monopoly on, on who God is, that we haven't cozied up with Him and become so familiar with divine things that we don't take them seriously anymore, and that we don't actually have a conviction to live them out. These folks had a call in their life, a call to respond to the good news, but none of that matters if you don't respond in sincere faith. And there's a challenge for anyone who is part of the religious system, myself included, to not be, I, I never want to stand up here and be a professional religious guy who just says religious stuff and then goes home. And my home life, life is just divorced from that totally. I go home, I take off the monkey suit, and I go, um, all right, I did my religious duty. I did my stuff, and now I'm going to do that. I, and, and I'm afraid we have, even we, we even have pastors that, that are like that, and they're not far away from just abandoning the faith, and, and that's a scary thing for me. So not only do we see the calling of the invited, but then we see the calling of the uninvited. Look at verse 8. He says, Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready. But those invited were not worthy. By the way, I, I missed something. you got to back up. He, he tells, he sends a fleet of servants to talk to these folks and say, Hey, come to the party. They said, No. Um, and then he should have burned, burned them right there, right? He should have, you know. But he said, No. Okay, they didn't get the picture. 
And so he sent some more servants to go and to say, hey, um, we have it already. I'm serious. We were serious when we said that. We have the fattened calf and we have all this stuff and we really want y'all to come. And that time, not only do they, do they, but they add insult to injury. They, they say, uh, no, and by the way, we're going to kill your servants. And so this is what led, this is, a, this is a king who is merciful and patient, and yet is being, being kicked on. So I want you to see that picture. So he says to the servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those who are invited were not worthy. Go therefore, instead of that plan, let's go to plan B, go to the main roads, invite to the wedding feast as many as you can find. And those servants went out to the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. And so now we have this picture. The king has this new assignment. He says, go wherever, find whomever, and invite them to the feast. And this symbolizes really the spread of the gospel to the Gentiles. That there in the first century, after, before 70 AD, and then after 70 AD, the gospel spread through uh, Gentile countries. And it still spreads through Gentile countries today. Countries that uh, at one time were Christianized and now we've become so familiar with those things. Guess what? History sometimes seems like it repeats itself. Uh, Christianity becomes kind of old hat in the United Kingdom and Wales and Scotland and England and, and Germany and in the United States. But it's still going in places in Asia, all the way to East Asia, um, in, in Latin American countries. And Central American countries, uh, it's still, the gospel still winning souls to life. And we pray for a revival here. That we would not think that we're done with God and over with that. And we need to, because life, if you've been here on Sunday morning, it's talking about the book of Ecclesiastes. There's not anything outside of this. There's not anything that satisfies and speaks to the soul like the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so these servants were faithful to go out and preach the news. And guess what? We're supposed to do that too, right? We're supposed to go out and we're supposed to tell anybody. Notice that he says both bad and good. Man, it's not our job to determine who's worthy and who's not. Our job is just to preach. Our job is just to share the good news of the king. Our job is just to call them to Christ. And so I want you to see the guests examined in. Look at verse 11. He says, but when the king came in and looked at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. Now we're going to talk about this. So don't cast judgment to quit. And he said to them, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless, it says. And then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, everyone was invited. A proper attire was still necessary. So there's this man standing there. He's got no wedding clothes on. And you've probably seen, you've probably been to some weddings. Uh, I know I have, where uh, people today wear some interesting things to weddings, right? Uh, you think, that's uh, different. But uh, that was a little less heard of back in that time. And now that you might want to throw somebody out who's dressed like that. Uh, but you, you just don't, right? It's just not proper. And so it was, a, it was the practice of ancient kings to provide the wedding garments for the guests. That's, that's a piece of information that is inferred by knowing the practices of that time. It was a practice for the king to supply the right garments. That's doubly the case, we can, we can guess, because these guests are invited last minute off the street. They're not, how could they be expected to have royal wedding garments on hand to come to the party? And so probably they needed to put on what was provided for them by the king. And so this is not a guy probably who's aloof to what's going on. He kind of just stumbled into the king's party one day. And he's not a guy who's too poor to afford the right clothes and he's just kind of a victim of circumstances. But this is a guy who purposely <coughs> rejected the king's good provision. The king tried to provide the right way of entry and he said, I don't want to do that. I'm going to go my way. And so sure, he wanted to come in and he wanted to eat some cake and drink some punch, but he wanted to come on his terms, with his clothing, with his own desires. And I wonder, isn't that some of us today? 
that we want to come and bring a religious experience and we want to have our kids learn good morals and maybe we want to make some good friends along the way and maybe feel good after an inspiring message sometimes, but we aren't willing to put on the clothes and own it. We aren't willing to come on the king's terms. We want to still have our own identity and our own agenda and our own things that we oppose and impose upon the king. And I think in churches, I think in Christian life uh, today, that's pretty normal. Uh, that's, that's pretty, uh, you know, God is here to, to help me. And I come, I'm already perfect, I'm already good. Kind of the, the more progressive Christianity says, hey, look, you're already good. And you just need to kind of realize how much God loves you. But that's not the Christian gospel at all. The Christian gospel says, friend, you're a sinner. But God loves you so much that he sent his son. And you can't do it. You can't, you can't crawl to God. You, you can't do enough works. You can't do enough stuff. You can't have good enough intentions to make this relationship right. It was so broken and so shattered and so strained, this relationship, this gulf between you and God, that the Creator needed to sin himself in likeness of human flesh to die and receive the wrath of God so that anyone who puts their faith in Him would be saved and not be under the just wrath and the punishment of sin. The world says, man, I, that's weird. I don't like that. But that's the gospel. That's what the gospel says. And to us, who the Holy Spirit is working in, it's a beautiful picture. It's a wonderful picture. And so, this guy didn't want to put the garments on. For this man, he's thrown into the outer darkness. That's a sure picture of eternal punishment. And, and it's, it's interesting, when his fate is pronounced, it says that he was speechless. And that doesn't mean dumbfounded tonight. It means that he had no excuse for his behavior. And, and friends, every single one of us, when we stand before the King of Kings, there is no excuse for how we act and, and for how we treat the gospel of Jesus Christ. None of us will have an excuse. He heard the call. He had responded externally. He stepped through the door, but he had never responded in his heart. He had never responded truly. And this is how some in the church are when we come to hang out, but we never surrender ourselves to Jesus. We used to do youth ministry. We could, we could get a lot of kids to come and hang out. We could have lock ins, we could have a lot of kids come and hang out. But my heart's cry was they haven't surrendered to Jesus yet. And so we always try to present the gospel with these things and uh, lock in and things like that. And, and many, many are called, many are invited, but few actually come, few actually surrender. And that was true for us. Many wanted to come and eat pizza, but very few were re ready to surrender their lives to the gospel, to take up a cross and follow them. And you can, when you think about it, that's not a surprise. That's not a, that's a call to, to surrender ourselves and and take up the cross of Jesus. Who chooses that, right? But for us, who the grace of God is working in, it's a choice we're willing to make. It's a decision. It's a, uh, it's a call upon our life. And so how do we get properly dressed? I want you to remember that it's the king's garments that you've got to put on. The king doesn't call you to bring your best garment. The king doesn't call you to knit yourself some good garments. Right? The king doesn't call you just to kind of go to the store or trade up for the right stuff. You've got to put on his garments. And we need to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And that comes by grace through faith. And when you're covered by the blood of the Lamb, that's friends when you're ready to party. You, you, can, you can be with the king because he supplies the covering for you. He supplies the garment that you wear. It's not a call to get better and to, you know, kind of just dress, fake it till you make it, you know, dress for the job you want, all these things, all these things that we say, no. You gotta you gotta get rid of your garment. You gotta get rid of your stuff. You gotta get rid of you gotta turn away from that stuff and take on the king's garments and his identity and the stuff he's provided for you in the name of Jesus. And then you can walk in and then you're ready for the party. Because he says this, he says, For many are called, Jesus says, but few are chosen. Many are going to hear the gospel message. Praise God through through Facebook Live. I pray many hear the gospel message through YouTube, through our website, through and 
millions of other churches across the world. I pray that people hear the message of the gospel. And, and many are called to come to Jesus, but it says few are, are chosen. People differ. It's not my intention tonight to talk about what exactly is meant by chosen. People differ on what that means. Here's the point. The one who gets to go to the party has to be wearing the right garment. And the garment is the righteousness of Christ. That's what justification means. That's our, that's our kingdom principle tonight. We receive this by grace, not by works, by simply the passive work of faith. It's the free gift of God that we receive by faith. When we confess with our mouth and we believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, we're saved. Justification means that God declares us righteous by counting the righteous works of Jesus as our own. And so that when we stand before the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, a holy God who, who we fall short of His glory, and we have no hope of standing before in our own strength. He looks at us and we're accepted by the works of Jesus that we wear like a, like a shining garment. And uh, that's my hope. That's all I got. I mean, that's, that's, that's my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's, all, that's, all I, that's my only thing I can walk before God with. I don't got any religious service worthy of heaven. My sermons aren't worthy of heaven. You know, my witness isn't worthy of heaven. My Bible study isn't worthy of heaven. My prayers don't make me worthy of all I got is the blood of Jesus. And I just wonder today, if you're listening or if you're sitting here, do you know? Do you know that you know that you're going to have a home in heaven? Not because of how good you are, because of how religious you are. Or because you tune in on a Wednesday night or you sit down on a Wednesday night or because you have the blood of Jesus covering you because you said one day, Lord, would you save me? Would you come into my heart? Would you be my Lord, my Master? Would you save me from my sin? I choose to follow you. If you haven't made that choice, you can make that choice. And you can, you can respond to the call and know that you have a home in heaven that your sins are forgiven in Jesus' name. So let me pray to that effect. If that stirs you, if you're just watching this, if that stirs you, you can respond. You can direct message the church, and I, I will see that, and we can dialogue about that. If you want to arrange a time that you want to meet with me, we can we can do that as well. I'd love to hear from you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that we have the blood of Jesus today, and that there was such a gulf of sin in our life, in each one of our lives, that it says that the waste of sin is death. That's, that's spiritual death. I've sinned today, but I didn't die. But that's because, just like Adam and Eve, they, they sinned. And then, to some people, it sounds like that serpent, that ancient dragon there in the garden, it sounded like he was right. He said, you surely won't die. And they ate that, that fruit, and they didn't die that day. But in a sense, yes, they did. They died spiritually. They became separated unto God until God provided the right garment for them. As they saw the shame of their nakedness, as God who provided instead of fig leaves that don't cover a picture of our religion and our systems that don't have any power to them. Lord, back there in that garden, you provided the covering for them. So Father, as we cling to your covering upon our life through the atonement of Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, for the one who listens, for the one who comes on Sunday morning, for the one who uh, comes to the party but doesn't quite get it yet. I pray, Lord, even tonight that they would bow the knee to you and know that they're saved today because they put their faith and trust in the only name under heaven by which men can be saved. It's the name of Jesus Christ. It's in the powerful, saving name of Jesus Christ that I pray tonight.